हेलो एंड गुड मॉर्निंग ऑल ऑफ यू वी आर ऑन यूनिट सेवन डिस्कसिंग एलेक्जेंडर पोप्स रेप ऑफ द लॉक इन द लास्ट क्लास वी टॉक्ड अबाउट द कैरेक्टर पोर्ट्रेट ऑफ बेलिंडा देयर इज वेनिटी सुपरफिशियलिटी नॉट ओनली इन द अपियरेंस ऑफ बेलिंडा बट इन द अपियरेंस एंड एजेंडा ऑफ द एंटायर इंग्लिश सोसाइटी एंड विच इज वाई दिस पोएम is not only satirizing few people but the entire british community and when we talk about alexander pope and his stature in the neoclassical age these are the characteristics which made him the most popular and the writer of all ages you may feel that the poem was written 400 years from the present age but even then when you read this poem rape of the lock again you will find that the essence of mock epic the freshness of satire and the beauty of ironical tone is still exist the belinda is still beautiful and the baron is still with that jealousy instinct the more you read the more you de deeper you are going to let's say go into this setting this scenario of 18th century british society friends in today's class i am going to end this this text and this unit so this is going to be the last lecture on rape of the lock in this 30 minutes lecture you would be able to evaluate terms like grub street hack writers and public sphere in reference to the select poem friends what are these terms you might not be familiar about them grub street or hack writers or public sphere in reference to the poem but you must understand that these terms these three terms are talking about the spirit of the age what kind of culture was prevailed in that age how used how these people used to spend their entire day what kind of silly activities they had involved themselves into and how they are let's say enjoying their life and in reality they are wasting their life they used to think that this is the true meaning of life true essence of life but in reality their life was hollow as well as shallow they were just like let's say people who know about english society and they do not want to know anything other than that this sense of superiority complex which existed in belinda was visible in all the english people of her age and alexander pope is in this way working as a prophet through this poem he is trying to pave a way to these people who do not know the actual purpose of life alexander pope is a true intellectual he knows how to live life and which is why he want to guide these people but in their own language these people loved reading poems so pope satirized through a poem had he written all these things through some other genre of writing people must have not have taken interest into that 
but Alexander Pope knew the pulse of the age, which is the very essence in the attitude of a proficient writer. So, with this note, let us now move to the first topic, the Grub Street and how is it related to our poem, Rape of the Lock. Grub Street, the world of literary hacks or mediocre, needy writers who write for hire. The term originated in the 18th century and was frequently used by writers. Friends, the literature was also not free from the projection. The show off which you can see in this poem, the grub street was a term used for the writers who are writing for the people who want to earn money and they can write anything which might give pleasure to the potential customers or the potential readers of their work. So, you can understand that writing was also commercialized and thus it was a big challenge for Alexander Pope to establish himself as a genuine writer of the 18th century. There was even a Grub Street Journal according to Dr. Samuel Johnson's dictionary Grub Street was and I quote here what Samuel Johnson has to say about this term Grub Street into his book dictionary. Originally, the name of a street in Moor Field in London, much inhabited by writers of small histories, dictionaries and temporary poems, whence any mean production is called Grub Street. So, initially this term was used for a street in Moorfield in London and uh, there were writers who used to live at that place and write small histories, dictionaries, temporary poems. It means they were part time writers, part time workers and with, with not much seriousness they used to write, they, their purpose was to earn money from writing. And which is why the content which they produced, that silly content through their writings named that street as Grub Street. There was also a let us say journal named as Grub Street Journal. Maybe the journal talked about the writers who are not taking this word work of writing very seriously. The term was a metaphor for the commercial production of painted matter, regardless of whether such matter actually originated in Grub Street itself. The street was renamed Milton Street in 1830. Friends, this Grub Street is let us say also used as a metaphor for the commercial production in printed matter. Commercial production means the production which is done to uh, let us say please any powerful authority in the society. Nobody knew that from where this matter actually originated in Grub Street. But people were just happy in getting the content published which favors their ideas. Later this Grub Street is renamed as Milton Street in 1830. So, maybe we can say that when the poem was written almost 80 or 90 years after that, this in the romantic age, this street is renamed as Milton Street. On March 4, 1714, Bernard Linton published Alexander Pope's The Rape of the Lock in five cantos. Now friends, when we look at this poem, Rape of the Lock, we see that initially it was published in five cantos only okay? and uh, uh, it was published in 1714. 
in addition to a title page in red and black, Lint, Lintot had accommodated the expense of a frontispiece and a plate for each of the five cantos along with headpiece, initial letters and tailpiece. So, we can see friends that when this poem was published, there was a complete projection which is added to this poem by the publisher. The publisher wanted to dress up the book like a women, which is why he let us say put the red and black as the title page and then the front piece and plate for each of five cantos. In the starting of five cantos, he added a plate for those five cantos and then he added a head piece, initial letter and a tail piece, a complete artificiality in this realistic poem. Although the poem was also talking about artificiality written in the mock heroic style by Alexander Pope, but then we can understand that the publisher has its own constraints and these people know how to sell the book. This was highly unusual for books of verse. Clearly these elements were fundamental to the book's design, but the majority of readers since 1714 have not encountered the object as Pope's first readers, is, readers did. So, when we look at this, let us say these things in the poem, we see that uh, almost an unusual kind of preparation was done for this book of verse. Although these things were fundamental to the design of the book, because book is also talking about artificiality of life. But the majority of readers since 1714 have not encountered the object as Pope's first readers did. So, later it happened that in the, let us say the second uh, publication, the third publication, all these things were removed. But in when the book was first published, it was full of these, uh, let us say, uh, beautifications. The rape of the lock was written because of a quarrel between two prominent Roman Catholic families, the farmers and the Petres. Over a relatively trivial incident, the young Robert, Lord Petre, the baron of the poem, had surreptitiously cut off the curl of Arabella's farmers hair. We know this. We discussed it in the background of the story. Arabella, the poem's is Belinda, was outraged. The incident proved so, so contentious that John Carlyle asked Pope if he would write a poem to heal the rift between the families. So, we can say that this poem was acting as a bridge to make friendship in these two families. The families were royal, popular and they wanted the blood of each other. They were so serious about that this trivial incident of cutting of lock that they were planning, let us say, uh, at a very larger level against each other, creating conspiracies, etc. So, we can understand, friends, that this incident was, let us say, meant to be explained through Grub Street. It was a serious attempt by Alexander Pope. Let us move to the next topic that is hack writers. A hack writer is a pejorative term for a writer who is paid to write low quality rushed articles or books to order often with a short deadline. So, who are the hack writers who write everything in a hurry, who are given the last moment job and who are always free for all such kind of let us say lower level of let us say intellectual works. In fiction writing, the hack writer is paid to quickly write sensational pulp fiction such as true crime novels or bodice ripping paperback. So friends, these let us say hack writers, they were famous for writing the crime novels or rape novels or something related to sensual pleasures, etc. 
in journalism a hack writer is deemed to operate as a mercenary or pen for hire expressing their clients political opinions in pamphlets or newspaper articles so friends when we talk about let's say journalism this field of journalism we see that these hack writers are used to create a propaganda there is a politician who want to spread his ideas and maybe to kill the ideology of the enemy the people used these hack writers you can understand that how much famous they used to be in the age hack writers are usually paid by the number of words in their book or article as a result hack writing has a reputation for quantity taking precedence over quality so friends these hack writers were so professional that they used to charge the money from the let's say person who is uh, uh, let's say offering their story to this let's say writer and they used to let's say get paid for the number of words you can understand how much professionalism existed in the 18th century they are just acting as a sponsors to project some idea in 18th century literary spirit was all pervasive and the authors were men not yet women of almost every class from distinguished courtiers like rale and sydney to the company of hack writers who starved in garrets and hung about the outskirts of the bustling taverns friends we can see that there was a complete decline in literature the literature which used to be written by rale and sydney who were most prestigious figures directly in contact with the king or queen now has reached to the writers who are starving for garrets and who used to hang about the outskirts wander here and there finding some sponsor some person whose idea these writers can project through their works let us now talk about the third topic that is third and last topic of unit 7 that is public sphere now to an extent we have talked about the grub street after that the hack writers who used to live in grub street and now we are moving towards the third topic that is public sphere how does it reflect the essence of the 18th century the second key structure is the literary public sphere it acts as a bridge between representative publicity and the bourgeois public sphere so this what friends what is this public sphere public sphere obviously means a place where people used to meet and plan for their future how society must take a new shape and they used to involve themselves into recent discussions to improve their intellectual abilities etc so the there were many places of public sphere the representatives of publicity used to meet with the bourgeois because as all of you know that there was a feudal structure in the society feudalism samantvad feudal structure was there in the society and in that feudal structure we had the bourgeois who want to protect their power their popularity and for that they need some publicity stunt so they used to visit these public spheres where they can meet few people who can project their ideology and create their grand image in the society the literary public sphere prepares people for political reflection by giving them the chance to discuss art and literature critically so friends these bourgeois people they used to uh, let's say project their knowledge of art their knowledge of literature 
they used to project themselves as intelligent people, intellectuals who can change the society, who can give a new direction to this society, considering lower class and middle class as their, let us say, followers. The political public sphere, where the public challenged and criticized state authority, developed from its literary predecessors. Then friends, we also have few people on these, uh, let us say, public spheres, who used to always criticize state authorities, some kind of, let us say, literary predecessors of the age, they used to exist there. The public discussion of literature and the art is promoted publicly by critical journals and periodicals, but also by the emotional experience of the conjugal family. So friends, not only people used to discuss about critical journals and periodicals of the age, but there are also many emotional experiences shared by the conjugal families, the royal families, who do not know much about the world, but they have some emotional appeal to showcase their, let us say, divinely personality. The shift away from representative publicity towards a literary public sphere is paralleled by the decrease in importance of royal courts and a related rise of towns. Friends, when we look at, let us say, this society, we see that the literary public sphere is at par to the royal courts and rise of towns. Why? Because people are migrating from villages to cities for better job opportunities. So there are people who can compare the village life and the city life. The towns are increasing, getting more and more popular, generating revenue to many people who are well established in the towns. The various social institutions and structures that develop within towns promote critical debate and the use of reason. So, there are many social institutions and structures developed in the city. You can call them as the people who are at par with the government, who are very powerful in the society. They were trying to promote critical debate and the use of reason or rationality into the society. Coffee houses were enormously popular in 18th century England. Customers could read newspapers, debate and hear the latest news. The quality of debate found in coffee houses led one writer to refer to them as penny universities. A cup of coffee usually cost a penny in the 17th century and all social classes mixed there. So, these people in the coffee houses used to discuss like let us say intellectuals used to discuss in universities. For a penny which costs a cup of coffee, they used to drink that and discuss a lot into those houses, coffee houses. Various attempts were made to close down London coffee houses by the government. Saloons were the continental invention and perhaps more socially exclusive than coffee houses. French writers and intellectuals met at the homes of other society figures to discuss and debate. So friends, when government took initiative to close these coffee houses, people started meeting in the saloons, although they have to pay a little more in saloons. On the other hand, in the French society, people used to meet at, at the houses of the intellect, intellectuals for discussion and debate. The saloon is traditionally located within the home in the domestic sphere. Similarly, the German reading clubs were restricted to a slightly more narrow bourgeois reading public. So friends, the impact of this public sphere was not only there in England, but in the entire Europe. We have talked about England, we have talked about France and now moving to Germany. What used to happen in Germany? There were, let us say, some reading clubs which were created by Germans in the domestic sphere of their houses. The bourgeois reading public, only few people were allowed to go there, 
read the books and involve into the intellectual discussions. In all these institutions, the key theme was critical debate about literature and reading material. So, the people were continuously, let us say, trying to improve their intellectual or literary skills. Hubermas argues that all were unconcerned with social status, addressed unthinkably questions and were by principle inclusive. So, these people were trying to think about unthinkable questions, the questions which are no use of the society. Like there is an island of intellectuals in Jonathan Swift's Gulliver Travels. If you read Gulliver Travels, there is an island where there are people who used to consider themselves as intellectuals, thinking about the unthinkable and useless things, trying to create nothing out of their scientific inventions. So, there is a sense of irony which, with which Jonathan Swift has created that community. This is largely true, but it must be remembered that he is still talking about the literate bourgeois public and not about the mass of community. So, here friends we see that these writers of the neoclassical age, they wish to criticize only the bourgeois public and not the common people. Common people are not at all concerned about these things. They are still busy in earning and making themselves survive in the expensive British society. Nothing productive was coming out from these coffee houses, although their visitors used to consider themselves as think tank of the age. So, we can see that Alexander Pope and many others have criticized these coffee houses as public spheres, because there was nothing intellectual or productive which used to come out from these, let us say, places. Although the regular visitors used to consider them as think tanks of the age, but they were not think tanks, but the silly bourgeois people had no exposure of the real life situations. I believe that now you have completely, let us say, understood about Alexander Pope's poetry and you have created a portrait in your mind about the 18th century British society. What kind of, let us say, hack writers used to be there or Grub Street or the, let us say, misuse of public sphere was there in the Pope's age, which is why the writers like Pope, Dryden, Swift were forced to write satires. They wanted to awaken the society from their artificiality and moving towards the realities of life. Maybe this could be the reason that neoclassical age later converted to romantic age and maybe this can also be one of the reasons of French revolution which was behind the romanticism or the movement of romanticism. That is all for today. Thank you for listening.